Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. And can I say how very pleased I am that some of you seem to have returned to the Museum of London for the second of these lectures on celebrity, on the construction and consumption of celebrity, to be strictly accurate. I did rather fear that I might have driven some of you away for good after a comment following my first lecture a month ago that it was surely the very first event uh, supported by Gresham College in which Theodore Adorno and Max Horkheimer, those German high intellectuals, had rubbed shoulders with Jordan, also known as Katie Price. In that first lecture, I contrasted two definitions of celebrity. Daniel Borstin's dictum that a celebrity is a person who is known for his well-knownness, and Andy Warhol's observation that in the future, everyone will be world famous for 15 minutes. I argued then that Borstin proceeds from a deep cultural pessimism and that Warhol hints at a more accessible and indeed democratic version of celebrity. I concluded by arguing that I found it difficult to subscribe to a post-structuralist approach to celebrity, such as that developed by P.D. Marshall, in which celebrities serve to control the masses and to channel their emotional energies. But that on the other hand, when Marshall writes that celebrities act as representative embodiments for the rest of us of what it is like to be an individual, I found myself in agreement. That, I went on to say, is surely why Warhol, rather than Borstin, is on the better side of this argument. Celebrity can be a form of liberation, which is why so many yearn to be world famous, perhaps, for 15 minutes. This evening, I want to explore how celebrities embody our own sense of what it's like to be an individual. Indeed, how they enact our best hopes and our worst fears. To put it simply, how they appear to explain ourselves to ourselves. But also, how this is often a collective cultural experience, by which I mean celebrities speak to all of us together, as well as to the individual. In a former time, that was perhaps what being a fan meant. When I look again at the black and white footage of the Beatles and their fans at Heathrow in 1965, and in particular at the banners, I have a clear sense of how a collective response coexists with an individual response to the Fab Four, and how being a fan, fandom, if you'll permit me, an ugly coinage, combines the private and the public that listening to the music at home and then being at the airport as part of the crowd there on the terminal roof is a kind of mirror image of our desire to know the private life of the public celebrity. Feeling that you know somebody who you could not possibly know is, I think, an essential part of the pleasure we derive from celebrity. And when these friends reveal themselves as being no better than they should be, then we are quick to condemn and indeed to punish them. So this evening, I also intend to explore what seems to me to be the dominant narratives that have attached themselves to the representation of celebrity, while also arguing that over the last two decades, popular television has fundamentally changed the way in which celebrity is both constructed and consumed. And latterly, we shall be guided through these thoughts by two women. Princess Diana and Jade Goody, who for me exemplify how we consume celebrity and the often vexed relationship that exists between ourselves as consumers, the celebrity and the media. That triangle that I talked about in my first lecture. A star is always a celebrity, but a celebrity need not be a star. That's how one of my students recently began an essay on celebrity magazines in the United Kingdom. It's a neat formulation with a nice ring about it. Clearly, Madonna is a star and also a celebrity. She has talent, for one thing, as a musician and an actress. Paris Hilton, on the other hand, is clearly a celebrity, but is there, say, talent on display in Paris Hilton's British Best Friend? Well, yes, there probably is, even if you or I don't particularly care for it. As Bertolt Brecht observed, we go to the theatre to see skill at work, and the same applies to television, and Hilton is nothing if not skillful. Within popular culture, there, there is then a clear kinship, I think, between stars and celebrities, 
even if they seem to belong to different constellations rather than coming from two distinct galaxies. This perhaps comes clearer when we consider the classic star system operating within popular American cinema and at its zenith in the 1940s and 50s. The cultural critic Fred Ingalls grapples with the distinction between stars and celebrities when he writes, Stardom once offered such solace. Its consolation and rapturous reassurance remain embedded in our faith in fame, even though so much has happened to us and to them since its cinematic peak in the 1950s. One way of grasping the history of celebrities since then is to see how admiration has become twisted by spite, gossip, by vindictiveness, and how the careless envy which, which were teenagers once adored the Beatles turned into the purposeful malignance with which Princess Diana was pursued to her death. But Ingalls, in contrasting a lost sense of solace with a supposedly malignant present, where the famous are simply victims, I feel ascribes passivity to the star or the celebrity that somehow flies in the face of the more active relationship that we, that we seem to have aspired to then and now. Richard Dyer, who wrote more thoughtfully and more persuasively than anyone on Hollywood stars, writes in his monograph, Heavenly Bodies, stars articulate what it is to be a human being in contemporary society. That is, they express the particular notion we hold of the person of the individual but they articulate both the promise and the difficulty that the notion of the individual presents for all of us who live by it. And he continues some pages later, stars represent typical ways of behaving, feeling and thinking in contemporary society, ways that have been socially, culturally, historically constructed. We might try to develop Dyer's reading of stars by considering one film star in particular and one pivotal role. It's Humphrey Bogart in Casablanca, directed by Michael Curtis for Warner Brothers in 1942. The story, you may recall, takes place in Casablanca, where Bogart, as Rick Blaine, runs Rick's Café Américain in a city that is administered by the Vichy French with Claude Rains as the corrupt chief of police Captain Renault. It is, of course, the Germans who are really in charge. Casablanca, in the film, is a kind of earthbound version of limbo where desperate Europeans, refugees from Nazi Germany, wait for visas that will allow them to take the plane to Lisbon and from there to ship to the United States and so to freedom. Now I'm going to try and play the trail from Casablanca if I can. <laughs> Casablanca, city of hope and despair, located in French Morocco in North Africa. The meeting place of adventurers, fugitives, criminals, refugees, lured into this danger-swept oasis by the hope of escape to the Americas. But they're all trapped, for there is no escape. Against this fascinating background is woven the story of an imperishable love and the enthralling saga of six desperate people, each in Casablanca, to keep an appointment with destiny. I was willing to shoot Captain Rhino, and I'm willing to shoot you. All right, Major, you asked for it. that you're in love with a woman. It's perhaps a strange circumstance that we both should love the same woman. What do you want for Sam? Don't buy and sell human beings. That's too bad. That's Casablanca's leading commodity. You can ask any price you want, but you must give me those letters. That's all. Right. I tried to reason with you. I tried to... Now I want those letters.
to this gloriously Hollywood version of Casablanca, created, of course, in the Warner Brothers' back lot in downtown Burbank, comes Ilsa Lund, that's Ingrid Bergman. She's married to Victor Laszlo, who's escaped from a Nazi concentration camp and who wants to get to America to continue the fight against fascism. Ilsa, we learn, has had a love affair with Rick in Paris when the Nazis marched into the city, though she failed to join Rick and his pianist Sam on the train travelling south. Victor, it seems, was not dead, as she had thought, but wounded, having escaped the Nazis, and needed Ilsa to help him. Ilsa knows that Rick, as we've seen, has a pair of blank letters of transit in his safe at the club that were stolen from German couriers. Will Rick give Victor and Ilsa the passes? Will he insist that it's he who takes Ilsa to the United States and not Victor? Will Victor go, leaving Ilsa in the arms of Rick? As Sam's great song, as time goes by, puts it, it's still the same old story, a fight for love of glory, a case of do or die. The world will always welcome lovers as time goes by. In the final reel, Rick puts duty before love, and Ilsa and Victor are hurried onto the plane for Lisbon as Bogart and Claude Rains decide to abandon Vichy Casablanca and to join the free French forces across the desert. Casablanca was made by Warner Brothers, a studio that was thought to be sympathetic to President Roosevelt and so to America entering the Second World War after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Precisely because it was Japan who destroyed the American fleet in Hawaii, however, there was a groundswell of opinion in the United States against the Roosevelt administration's Europe First policy. The decision to deal with Germany before moving against Japanese forces in the Pacific. This perhaps explains why the movie Casablanca was rushed into an early release to coincide with the Allied invasion of North Africa, including for the first time American forces in November 1942. So one way of reading this film is as a kind of fictional why we fight tract, explaining to the audience the necessity of the Europe first policy. And the sequences in Paris where Rick and Ilsa first fall in love are cunningly designed to appeal to the particular American soft spot for Paris. This is the city, after all, where all good Americans go to die. This is the American version of Europe, a foggy day in London town and George Gershwin's An American in Paris. But through Humphrey Bogart, with his star persona shaped around the ideal of rugged individualism, the film tackles another issue vital to the success of America's war effort. Americans must work together to win. Individualism, that keystone in the building of an American cultural identity, must be laid aside for the duration. So Rick overcomes his personal feelings and arranges for Ilsa and Victor to have the passes to continue their fight against the Nazis in America, even killing the SS Major Strasser in the process. An individual moral act for sure, but committed, of course, on behalf of everyone, all of us. How else is the plane carrying Ilsa and Victor to take off for Lisbon? Then Rick and Captain Renault, comrades now, set out to join the Free French forces shoulder to shoulder. Through Humphrey Bogart, America embraces the idea of collective action in the face of a common enemy. Now, do celebrities mediate politics and social issues in quite so direct way as the traditional film star? Stardom, after all, was constructed around the idea of the star's unchanging core identity from role to role and film to film. While, as I will argue later, changeability lies at the very heart of celebrity. John Wayne is always John Wayne, even when his career began to ride into the last sunset. Joan Crawford is Joan Crawford and Bogart, Bogart. Whether he's Rick Blaine, Sam Splade, Philip Marlowe or Charlie Allnut. Victoria Adams, on the other hand, has been Posh Spice, Mrs Beckham, a supermodel, a mother and the designer behind DVB style with jeans and sunglasses and, of course, as we can see, the kind of handbag that really is a miniature cabin trunk. But in her very changeability, perhaps, 
Victoria Beckham has articulated a range of shifting attitudes about what it means to be a woman on the cusp of the 20th and 21st centuries. The feminist agenda of autonomy and equality is taken for granted in the idea of girl power. And thereafter, she has lived some of the choices that are available for the newly empowered woman. Marriage on her terms quite as much as those of her husband. A family and a career. And maybe too, she's played a modest role in redrawing the frontiers of masculinity in what has been dubbed the post-feminist era. The ice is thin here, so I tend to hug the shore. But when she encouraged her husband to step out in what the popular press christened a skirt, but those in the fashion know knew to be a sarong, was she deliberately feminising one of England's most gifted footballers. I'm perhaps at this stage numbering too many trees. We need first to map the forest itself. So before I move too deeply into reading how the lives and times of individual celebrities impinge upon those of the legions of individual consumers for whom they have significance, we should perhaps locate these readings in a more general and a theoretical context. Cultural theorists, social anthropologists and sociologists have all attempted to theorise our relationship with celebrities, to map it to. In his book, Understanding Celebrity, the Australian scholar Graham Turner draws our attention to the work of Joshua Gamson. Gamson, says Turner, developed a typology that mapped the levels and characteristics of the audience's engagement with the consumption of celebrity in his book, Claims to Fame. The book was developed out of a series of focus groups designed to discover whether the nature of our interest in celebrities was affected by whether or not we were aware of the role played by the publicity industry in the production of celebrity. Gamson was also interested in whether his focus groups, um, in whether his focus groups discovered that st thought that stories about celebrities were true or false, and whether they played any part in the pleasure that they derived from an interest in celebrity. Gamson identifies five audience types. There is the traditional. These are men and women who believe that what they see and what they read is how it is and how it was. For them, celebrity stories are indeed reported news and not in any sense manufactured. Indeed, it seems that they have very little knowledge or understanding of the processes involved in the production of celebrity. Cruelly, perhaps, Gamson describes their responses as essentially passive. Their interaction with celebrity, he writes, involves modelling, fantasy and identification. For this group, Freddie Starr did indeed snack out late one night on Lee LaSalle's pet hamster. Second order traditionalists are a step up. Or, to put it another way, Freddie Starr ate the hamster but got someone to tell the press about it. As Gamson writes, these audiences see a more complex narrative in which publicity mechanisms play a part but do not pose an obstacle to holding the celebrities in high esteem. This group, he reports, trusted their own ability to distinguish between the authentic and the manufactured and were more discerning when it came to seeing celebrities as role models, objects on which to project fantasies or simply identifying with them. Postmodernists, says Gamson, know about celebrity manufacture and seek out its evidence and its details, rejecting the story of the naturally rising story of celebrity as naive and false. They know that the hamster lives, that the story was concocted by journalists working closely with Freddie Starr's public relations adviser Max Clifford, and that Lee LaSalle was the girlfriend of a man who was then writing Starr's autobiography. For postmodernists, celebrity stories are fictions that have to be unpacked. But knowing this in no way diminishes their enjoyment. They take pleasure in the artifice that surrounds the whole production of celebrity. We can take the last two game player groups together. Both gossipers and detectives regard the coverage of celebrity in the media as semi-fictional. They are, says Gamson, not particularly concerned about the origins of these stories or indeed if they tell the truth about a celebrity or not. 
They both have a high level of understanding of the processes that are involved in the manufacture of celebrity. What distinguishes both groups is the uses to which they put the material that they gather about celebrity as, this is Gamson again, fodder for their own cultural activities. Celebrity production is for the detective a giant discursive playground and for the gossiper a rich social resource. These consumers, says Gamson, use celebrities not as models or fantasies but as opportunities. So the games players hurry to the office photocopier or the water cooler to spread the news of Freddie Starr's misdemeanour, mixing admiration and disapproval in equal measure. Celebrities, after all, are supposed to behave badly. They do things that we cannot or dare not. Detectives, on the other hand, find pleasure in working out exactly how the hamster story came about and filing it away under media conspiracies. Freddie Starr's midnight snack somehow confirms their own worth and value. They are uniquely in the know. Graham Turner would argue that Gamson's categories are just a little too neat and tidy, that the punishment is made to fit the crime rather than the other way round. On the other hand, this typology and others too are, I think, a useful reminder of the diverse ways in which we consume celebrity that a one-size-fits-all approach is clearly at odds with our own personal experience and that, and that of those around us. Gamson also reminds us that the consumer is neither an innocent dupe or a savvy cultural critic, that most of us have an understanding of what is involved in the manufacture of celebrity and that knowing the processes can indeed even enhance our pleasure. A small visual example, I think, will make this point. Here is one of the great celebrity pictures. Marilyn Monroe in New York City during the shooting of the Billy Wilder movie, The Seven Year Itch, with the breeze from a passing subway blowing up her skirt. The conceit of the image is that while we know that Marilyn Monroe is surrounded by the film crew, by photographers, and a huge crowd of passerbys who've been alerted to the filming, we somehow believe that she is doing this just for us when we look at the photograph. That actually is not my point. This is really the consumer's pleasure in celebrity. Two visitors to Manhattan can become Marilyn of a kind for the camera. Identification and recreation. In the future, everyone can dream that they are world famous for 15 minutes. Why else do so many visitors to London insist on having their photograph taken on that zebra crossing in Abbey Road? For the record, the scene with Marilyn Monroe on the subway grating was shot twice for the Wilder movie. The first take was shot at Manhattan's Lexington Avenue at 52nd Street, and the second done in a studio sound, on a studio sound stage. And this is the version that you will see in the finished film. According to one source, the original on-location footage's sound had been rendered completely useful, useless by an enormously overexcited crowd present during filming, whistling over Munro's see-through panties. To return to Gamson's uh, typology, Graham Turner is surely right when he argues that we consume celebrity in different ways and often simultaneously. That we can be Gamson's traditionalists, believing in what we are shown, while also games players bending the material to our own purposes. A good example of this might be how audiences view the X Factor. Like so much popular television now, the X Factor is a hybrid programme. It's a cross between a talent contest and a game show. When audiences watch the talent in action, they believe in what they see. It's a version of music entertainment, a television concert with the extra frisson that the acts are being judged. And to a great extent, I think we willingly suspend our disbelief, what we know and what we may have seen or read about the grooming of the artists on display and the commercial imperatives that drive the whole project. These are kids having a go. However, when we come to vote, when our fingers are poised above the dialing pad, I think we morph into detectives or games players, determined to beat the judges or make sure that our new best friend wins. 
remembering another corner of the television world, how else do you explain Anne Widdicombe or John Sargent's successes on Surely Come Dancing? It wasn't the dancing, that's for sure. If Joshua Gamson considers the uses that we make of celebrity from the perspective of the consumer, Graham Turner offers us a kind of top-down rather than bottom-up account of the relationship. In Understanding Celebrity, he writes about what he calls the social function of celebrity. Celebrity, he argues, generates parasocial interactions that operate as a means of compensating for changes in the social construction of the communities within which many of us live. I think an obvious example of this would be the extraordinary grief that was provoked by the death of Princess Diana in Britain and around the world. Thousands of people came to Kensington Palace in the week after her death, before her funeral, to lay flowers in front of what had been Diana's London home. A personal act for a woman that none of them can have really known personally. An assumption of friendship with the dead princess. Once this word parasocial would have been used here pejoratively to suggest that this assumption of friendship with Princess Diana was fulfilling an absence in a person's life that possibly grew from their failure to establish proper, by which was meant genuine and even real, social relations. However, I would want to argue that in the wake of the public grief at Diana's death and comparable manifestations of public feeling that we have to revise our ideas about parasocial relations. Whether they fill a void in individual lives, they are undoubtedly genuine in terms of human feelings, if nothing else. If you'll allow me to be anecdotal, a friend reminds me of an extraordinary moment that he witnessed on the London Underground in the middle of the week between Diana's death in Paris and her funeral in London. It was the morning of rush hour and the carriage was packed. At one end, someone began to weep while reading a newspaper. Within minutes, he reports the whole carriage was in tears, some sobbing, some weeping silently. And then men and women standing and sitting began to talk, to comfort each other, even holding hands. Who is to say that this is not a manifestation of real feelings? To call it, I think, mass hysteria is just a little glib. Chris Rojek underlines my arguments in a passage from his thoughtful study, Celebrity. To the extent that organised religion has declined in the West, celebrity culture has emerged as one of the replacement strategies that promotes new orders of meaning and solidarity. As such, notwithstanding the role that some celebrities have paid in, played in destabilising order, celebrity culture is a significant institution in the normative achievement of social integration. It would seem then clear that celebrity can be partly explained as a location for the interrogation and elaboration of cultural identity, to borrow Graham Turner's phrase, and in particular as confirming and extending our sense of individual identity. As P.D. Marshall writes in Celebrity and Power, the types of message that the celebrity provides for the audience are modalized around forms of individual identification, social difference and distinction, and the universality of personality types. Celebrities represent subject positions that audiences can adopt or adapt in their formation of social identities. Each celebrity represents a complex form of audience subjectivity that when placed within a system of celebrities provides the ground in which distinctions, differences and oppositions are played out. The celebrity then is an embodiment a discursive battleground on the norms of individuality and personality within culture. Celebrities, it would seem, confirm us in our urge to be unique. At the same time, as Fred Ingalls has written, celebrity is invented on a large screen upon which is projected a huge and distorted magnification of some of society's most contested values. So underpinning our consumption of celebrity, there is a fruitful tension between a desire for affirmation and confirmation of an individual identity, but within a site that also negotiates the fault lines that run through our culture. 
So grief at the death of Princess Diana is both sorrow at the loss of a friend who supplied proof of self-worth and a cry of fury at the distribution of power in our society. Who can forget the sight of the Queen at the gates of Buckingham Palace, bowing slightly as Diana's coffin passed by? We were allowed to feel that it was us, the weight of public opinion, that had brought the royal family down to the streets, to our level, to acknowledge our grief. A very particular political and personal circle, I think, was squared at that moment. To borrow a phrase from the 1960s, the personal is always the political in the consumption of celebrity. This is the Fall of Icarus, painted by the Italian Baroque artist Carlo Saracini, cruelly described by one art historian as a first-class painter of the second rank. But it's not the quality of the work that I want to explore, but its subject matter. Icarus, as you will remember, was the son of Daedalus, an Athenian craftsman who was desperate to escape from the island of Crete. King Minos, the king of Crete, for whom he had built the celebrated labyrinths to house the Minotaur, had imprisoned Daedalus in his palace for having assisted Ariadne, daughter of the king, to assist Theseus in turn to destroy the terrifying half-man, half-bull, and then find his way out of the labyrinth and escape. In order to make his own escape from Crete, the ever-inventive Daedalus made two pairs of wings from wax and feathers, one for himself and the other for his son Icarus. Before they took to the air, he warned Icarus that he must not fly too close to the sun. But dizzy with excitement of flight, Icarus soars upwards, and so the wax melts, the feathers fall, and Icarus, as we can see, plunges into the sea below. Now, this myth of Icarus seems to me to be the dominant narrative of contemporary celebrity. A version of From Rags to Riches, and back to rags, coloured by that purposeful malignance that Fred Ingalls noted in the passage from A Short History of Celebrity that I quoted at the beginning of this lecture. There he wrote about how admiration has become twisted by spite, gossip by vindictiveness, and how the careless envy with which teenagers once adored the Beatles turned into the purposeful malignance with which Princess Diana was pursued to her death. And the media play an essential role in this process, building and buttressing celebrity on the way up and then reversing the process. It begins with the red carpet and it ends with the long lens paparazzi shot of the former celebrity slumped over a table littered with empty bottles. This is Britney Spears at the height of a career that has seen her sell in excess of 100 million records worldwide. An icon on teenage bedroom walls, princess of the airwaves, the middle-aged men driving around that contemporary version of Dante's third circle of hell, the M25, and on its overseas equivalents. And the font, so to speak, of wonderful copy for journalists. Then came her first marriage to a childhood friend that lasted a mere 55 hours. A second marriage to the dancer Kevin Federline and children. And when Spears filed for divorce from Federline in November 2006, the wax on her wings was decidedly sticky and melting. On February the 16th, 2007, she checked into a drug rehabilitation facility in Antigua for less than a day. The following night, she shaved her head with electric clippers at a hair salon in Tarzana, California. It would be easy to blame the media for rounding on Britney Spears. But it was Spears who chose to shave her head and presumably to permit the pictures. Nevertheless, Fred Ingalls is surely right when he suggests that we who follow celebrities have a stake in their fall from grace as much as their rise to success. It's a kind of schadenfreude, a pleasure in their downfall, proof that they are indeed no better than they should be or to put it another way, a vindication of our own selves and our worth. That said, there are times when you want to look away. 
I'm going to show you Jade Goody's interview with the News of the World when she'd been asked to live, leave the Big Brother house in January 2007 after she'd been accused of racist bullying of the Indian actress Shilpa Shetty an event which provoked what has, to me at least, all the hallmarks of a modern witch hunt, with the press in full pursuit and politicians wading in. Channel 4 television was finally censored by the regulator Ofcom, and Big Brother was rested by the network for a season. I'm not getting paid by the news of the world or by anybody else that I do. I'm, all the money that I um, would have got off of the news of the world is going to be donated to charities and the money that I would have got off of Endemol for doing Big Brother is going to charities and the money that I get off of anything else in, in regards to Big Brother I don't want because it's, it's not right money, it's wrong money because it's money that I'm getting to talk about things that are not nice and, and, and not morally right and I am really really sorry I am I really am I'm like I'm so so ashamed and so stupid I don't want anybody to feel that they're scared of me or intimidated by me I just don't know how to argue I've just I've only ever been brought up on watching people argue with swear words in it and, and the aggression that I that I held and I don't want that. I don't want that aggression and I will make sure I get help so that aggression doesn't come out my gate. I don't think it's the sheer, the tears that are shocking, nor indeed the rambling thoughts of a woman who is clearly on the edge of a nervous breakdown at this moment. It's quite as much uh, the mismatch between the jade that was and the jade that is here being interviewed the news of the world. Or to put it another way, the jade that we thought we knew as a friend, brash, loudmouthed, the epitome of Essex girl, but with a heart of gold, one of us. She's now become a young woman who is everything that we might like to hide about ourselves. We long to be like the ploughman in Bruegel's painting of the Icarus story, which is so well understood by W.H. Auden in his poem, Musée des, Beaux des Beaux-Arts. In Bruegel's Icarus, this is, it, this is Auden. How everything turns away quite leisurely from the disaster. The ploughman may have heard the splash, the forsaken cry, but for him it was not an important failure. The sun shone as it had to on the white legs disappearing into the green water and the expensive, delicate ship that must have seen something amazing. A boy falling out of the sky had somewhere to get to and sailed calmly on. After the fall of Jade, we too wish to sail calmly on in search of the next idol whose feet will all too soon be revealed on our behalves as being made of clay. For celebrities, however, the question is how to avoid this catastrophe, how not to fall to earth, or rather into the sea, in a shower of feathers and melted wax. The simple answer is reinvention. No one, I think, demonstrated the art of reinvention better than Princess Diana, and no one understood how essential to this process the media were. Consider the timing of her now celebrated interview with Martin Bashir for the Panorama programme. Diana's biographer, Sarah Bradford, suggests, on Diana's specific instruction, the BBC released their press announcement on the 14th of November, an unwelcome 47th birthday surprise for Charles, who was on an official visit to Tokyo. Photographs taken at the time show him cutting a celebratory cake, his face expressing total dismay. And Bradford's admirable biography is full of examples of how Diana worked with the media. The pictures they published over the 16 years, from her engagement to Prince Charles to her death in Paris, after the car in which she was travelling with Dodi Fayed crashed into the 13th pillar of the underpass at the Place d'Alma on August the 31st, 1997, tell, I think, the story of this reinvention. On her engagement, Diana Spencer, she was then, looks every inch a blushing English rose. The puppy fat is still lingering slightly, and she peers out diffidently from under her fringe, protected by her husband-to-be. Hardly the truth, since we all know that she was a good deal taller than he was, is. But the conventional iconography gives us, of course, the strong man embracing the little woman. 
Here's Cinderella, the girl who got a prince and in this version of the royal fairy story married him and kissed him in public too. Then comes motherhood and notice the deliberate informality of it all. Hoop earrings are not a pearl in view. Diana's hair wet and she and her two sons laughing at their father. It could be a snapshot from any family album. Then it's royal duties in public, but a royal mother and always with an interest in children. Notice the hair too. No one better understood how to use her hair to shape an image. Here it's cut short, every inch the modern mum to be found then in magazines for women and advertising. The blonde streaking too is unmistakably the late 80s, nudging the 90s. This is, of course, a radical change of image. Diana shaking hands with a man suffering from AIDS. In a deliberate break with protocol that members of the royal family don't touch much, she shows that she is her own woman. The people's princess is under construction as her marriage begins to fall apart. The War of the Wales was out in the open and Diana proved herself infinitely more skilled in getting her case into the headlines and on the front pages. She had made a personal friend of Richard Kay, the royal correspondent of the Daily Mail, as Sarah Bradford notes in her biography. On the night that Charles admitted his adultery with Camilla Parker Bowles in his television interview with Jonathan Dimbleby, Diana fulfilled a long-standing engagement at the Serpentine Gallery in London's Hyde Park. She wore a sexy, clinging black dress which showed off her tanned, toned legs. Her whole manner radiated confidence, writes Sarah Bradford. Diana's supermodel was about to take to the international runway and with a suitable portfolio of pictures. A supermodel, though with a social conscience, who cared about her causes, like the campaign for banning landmines. Even then, Diana looked and dressed the part which is not for a moment to doubt her sincerity, but simply to understand, underline her understanding of how to sustain a celebrity identity in the face of the baleful Icarus narrative. I've looked at no more than a handful of the transformations through which Princess Diana's celebrity identity morphed. And it continues to surprise me that nowhere in the huge literature generated by this woman's short life and untimely death, is there any detailed account of this process or her own direct role in it? So much of the literature proposes itself as biography rather than cultural analysis, thus playing a variation on the public-private duality that is, of course, at the very heart of our interest in celebrity. Biography offers us the promise of the private life behind the public face, that trope which is at the heart of celebrity magazines like Hello and OK. So the penultimate chapter of Diana's life is reported as the unlikely love affair between herself and Dodi Fayed. Rather than her joining a version of what used to be called the International Jet Set, and before that, Café Society. How right it is, culturally speaking, that Diana's final holiday should have been a cruise in the Mediterranean. Ever since the 1930s, and certainly after Edward VIII and Mrs. Simpson had stale, sailed on the steam yacht Narlin in 1936, this was where, in Nell Coward's cruel description, Nescafe society met. Diana's final celebrity identity was not the one, of course, she would have chosen for herself. On the eve of Diana's funeral, the historian David Starkey remarked in a radio interview on what had all the appearances, he said, of a new Marian cult, with flowers in her memory and even visions of the dead princess. If it was Mary, then it was Mary Marta Dolorosa, she who suffers with us and for us, a channel for our prayers for grace. It was, above all, a kind of sanctification. And this is the point where the life and death of Diana, I think, touches that, unlikely though it may seem, of Jade Goody. Goody understood quite as well as Diana that a celebrity identity needed to be continually reinvented if it wasn't to fall to earth. In the third series of Big Brother in 2002, she created a public persona out of her apparent ignorance. 
mistaking Rio de Janeiro as a person, not the second city of Brazil, and apparently being unaware that Aberdeen was in Scotland, or that the United States was an English-speaking nation. On being evicted from the house, she established a fruitful relationship with the media, which led to her own television programmes and the launch of her own products, notably a perfume called Shh. Of course, nothing Shh Goody, who lived her own private life on the front pages of the tabloids, particularly once her relationship began with Jack Tweed. In a sense, I think, Jade Goody fulfils Andy Warhol's prophecy that in the future everyone will be world famous for 15 minutes. Reality TV programmes like Big Brother have created celebrities out of ordinary people. Not in their millions, certainly, but in their thousands. According to Francis Bonner, as many as 20,000 ordinary people appear with speaking roles on our television screens every year. Then came Jade Goody's downfall. There's a revealing passage in her autobiography, Jade Fighting to the End. By the end of 2006, I was experiencing the biggest high of my career. My perfume was selling like hotcakes and making me more money than I could ever have dreamt. My first book had become a number one bestseller. And I had three reality TV shows under my belt, with more being talked of for the next year. I would never have thought that four years after going into the Big Brother house, I would still be in the public eye and people would still be interested in what I had to say or want to buy things that had my blooming name on them. But I was eternally grateful and I never took it for granted for one second. I had achieved a lot, but I was under no illusions. I knew it could all end as easily as it started. At one level, this is an entirely conventional response to fame. It came unexpectedly and overnight, and it could all end tomorrow morning. That is what readers expect. But this comes at a moment in Jade Goody's story when she's about to agree to go back into the Big Brother house for a second time and with most of her own family. Taken in this context, Goody reveals herself as adept as any celebrity in understanding the need to renew her identity. In the event, returning to the Big Brother house was a disaster. It's the disaster that we already heard about with Jade summarily evicted from the house for racist bullying and dropped by her sponsors and supporters, her agent too. According to her autobiography, they even removed her perfume from the shop displays. Scandal and its messenger gossip are, of course, intrinsic to celebrity. As Fred Ingle says, a scandal, I suppose, is a, told, a tale told by, in which the permissible or admirable aspects of character are isolated by transgression. Celebrity, by definition, attracts scandal. It does so first because fame invites envy and envy denigration. This motion is nowadays becoming industrialized by the production and sale of celebrity television, and magazines, let alone by advertising the industry of propaganda. What then after the scandal? The most radical survival weapon in the celebrities' armory, rehab. Sign into the Betty Ford Clinic or the Priory and it's a kind of time out. That or appear on Larry King Live and admit everything. Both are a form of penance and if they're paid properly, may well allow you to rescue your celebrity status. Should we think of these perhaps as clinics where you can stitch together a new public persona, cosmetic surgery for the celebrity? It worked for George Michael and it worked for Jade, both of whom were born again celebrities after the Priory and Larry King. It worked for Jade, that is, until when taking part in the Indian version of Big Brother, Big Boss, she was told that she was suffering from cancer and that she needed to fly home immediately for urgent treatment. On returning home, Goody's reinventions proceed at a dizzying pace as her health deteriorates. She published a new autobiography, she appeared in pantomime, was back on reality television in a documentary, Living with Jade Goody, part of Living TV's Living with series. 
Goody was guided through the final stages of her life by Max Clifford, who we might think of as a kind of celebrity ringmaster as well as the ringmaster of celebrity. With Clifford advising her, Jade Goody turned the most primate moment of her life, her imminent death, into a series of public celebrity events. A film, Jade's Cancer Battle, was broadcast and there were plans for more programmes if Goody felt strong enough to take part. Then she very publicly married Jack Tweed. The happy couple had signed an exclusive £700,000 deal with OK Magazine for exclusive photographs of the ceremony, at which Goody wore a £3,500 Manuel Mota dress given her by the owner of Harrods, Mohammed Al Fayed. Jay Goody's funeral took place on April the 4th, 2009. If her death was not quite the kind of sanctification that Diana's had been 12 years earlier, if the crowds were smaller in East London and the flowers fewer, something similar had taken place. Jade had joined the ranks of the good celebrities. Her passing was even accorded a ministerial blessing. The then Health Secretary, Andy Burnham, declared, Jade's bravery and openness in her fight against cervical cancer has brought home to young women across the world the importance of regularly going for checks. Disease and even death play a powerful role, I think, in the construction of celebrity. We are, in that, reminded of our own mortality. As Francis Bonner writes, celebrity has become one of the principal ways in which information is disseminated, including information about such apparently different fields as entertainment and politics. Even health advice is provided through celebrity encounters with illness and their recovery, or death in the case of Jade Goody. A final thought. Those whom the gods love die young. Jade Goody was 27, Princess Diana 36. Dying young perhaps grants a celebrity a kind of lease on cultural immortality that is different from that we give to those who live on to a time when rightness is all. We, alas, grow older as they remain young forever. In that sense, they perhaps fulfil our yearnings for eternal youth as well as providing an intimation of a possible immortality. Thank you very much indeed. And I should be happy to answer questions if anyone would like to. There's a microphone. If you'd like to put your hand up, we'll get the microphone to you. If anyone would like to ask any questions. There's a question at the front row here. Um, since they died, both... Um in my experience at least, both Diana and uh, Jay Goody have vanished um, from uh, popular culture. Um, so do you think that um, <coughs> the outpouring of grief, particularly for Diana, was <coughs> transitory and, and, and that's what celebrity <coughs> means? I think I'd, I'd answer that in two ways. Yes, of course it was transitory. One of the surprises <coughs> was how little the 10th anniversary of Diana's death meant for so many people. On the other hand, I think it represents a turning point in people's feelings about celebrity, which is really perhaps what I was trying to say. So um, it's not so much that, that Jade Goody and Diana continue that, that kind of dominant presence that both had, as what both achieved within their celebrity status, I think fundamentally has changed Diana's case through her death enormously perhaps less in Jade's case, our attitudes towards celebrity and the way in which we, we use them and view them. Uh, lest uh, my question be seen as uh, an indication of partiality, I shall proceed it by saying, when I go to the supermarket, my wife sends me to the supermarket, uh, I notice that there are yards and yards of uh, celebrity magazines aimed at women, and, and I wonder, do you have any comments about gender as consumers of uh, celebrity? Yes, I think this is a very interesting idea that, that, that in fact the magazines and you know, the joke about OK and Hello 
for example, is that you read them in the hairdressers um, uh, uh, because the hairdresser is normally unisexual. Um, uh, in fact, when we look at the demographics of both magazines, I'm told, these of course are kind of fairly closely guarded secrets, that large numbers of men do read them. But it is true that, that, that it is uh, women who are thought to be the prime consumers of celebrity. Um, I think that may have something to do with, and this is a more complicated idea perhaps for another time, to do with the way in which gossip attaches itself to celebrity. And gossip as a means of communication. Um, uh, often to those who are disempowered or those who have been traditionally been disempowered. Uh, and it may be there's, there's something in that little circle that explains why celebrity means such an enormous amount uh, to, to women, perhaps rather more than men. But men are interested in celebrities. I mean, think no further than Jeremy Clarkson. Um, you know, uh, the most masculine in a kind of rather uh, almost um, uh, stereotypical way idea of, of masculine interest, men and machines. Uh, so I think there is an interest. Um, but maybe the gossip is the key to it. It has to do something with uh, uh, the link between the two and the disempowering of women within our culture uh, uh, until comparatively recently, maybe still perhaps. At the back, sorry to make you run. <laughs> um, just sort of to add um, to uh, what was um, that wonderful question, um, I could also postulate that perhaps um, women have, um, are sort of culturally expected to be more concerned with frivolous things and um, perhaps that's sort of part of the the stereotypical gender roles that we fit into. And I think that's true. On the other hand, I'm, I'm, I'm very struck by, by, by some work that was done in relation to women's magazines, and in particular the, the kind of pillars of the women's magazine markets a while ago by, by, by academics, women's own, women's realm, woman. Uh, they argued that the, that, 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 that the image of women that you get in these magazines is precisely the image you've described. People who move no further than keeping your husband at home, uh, having children and looking after your children. Uh, what they ignore is that the large proportion of the readership of these magazines, social groups, C1, C2, D&E, are in fact the people who run the family. In the sense they run the rent or the mortgage, they run the, the cost of heating, lighting, uh, they run the food budget. Um, certain items are privileged for the men, which nearly always to do with technology, motor cars, hi-fi, televisions. But by and large, these women um, uh, do all of that. And, and, the, and, the, and the, the, the argument there was that, in fact, that it suited women uh, to be uh, constructed in this particular way in these magazines because it gave them a space in which what they actually knew about what they do could remain a secret that they could share with each other in this kind of privileged space. That's a long answer, but th there's quite a lot of work that's been done to suggest that this is a knowing thing amongst certain groups of, of, of women readers, at least in magazines, I think. So I'm always, I'm always wary of stereotypes. You know, stereotypes are a very easy way of, 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 of answering questions that we often find embarrassing and difficult. And one should always ask, do people choose stereotypes? You know, do Americans choose all to wear 10-gallon hats, cowboy boots, and shoot first, as one of my students wrote in a paper this week, uh, talking about stereotypes? No, of course not. But, th but people do wear cowboy hats, they do wear uh, uh, boots, and they do carry guns. Why? You know, more questions, I think. Anybody else? Yes. Let me see if I can get this out um, because it's sort of a branch off of what you've spoken about today, but I know that you mentioned Chris Rojek, and I know that he talks about um, a typology of fame, um, different types. So, and I know that within this lecture, you've spoken primarily about um, people that have become famous and achieved celebrity out of um, sort of what he calls attributed. Mm -hmm. um, these are attributed celebrities. Um, and I was wondering if you had any thoughts on, say, the way that the media... Um, in terms of the definition of talent and the role that that plays, and I know that um, there are varying degrees of, uh, of how you define talent. You know, they can range from individual to individual. And um, I was wondering if you think that there's, there should be a distinction or a, a different classification of people in the media um, that have, say, are more achieved celebrities out of their talent and... Um, 
rather than, say, through cultural intermediaries? Can I answer that in, in a kind of roundabout way? I'm, I'm glad to find someone else who thinks Rojak is important. I think it's a terrific book, actually, and, mm -hmm. and one that everybody who's interested in the topic should read. I find it immensely helpful. It's one of the first things I read as I was preparing uh, these lectures. Um, anyway, to answer your question, um, I think the problem is that we have, there are kind of fairly strictly controlled ideas of what talent is. Mm -hmm. um, and talent is marketed within those fairly strict sets of rules. I mean, the X Factor, for ex example, is a very good example of the way in which talent is constructed within the context of that program in a different way. Now, that idea of talent, which is tied up with the notion of spectacle and performance, is um, you know, the one we think of as talent. People who appear on Trish Goddard's program um, or Jeremy Kyle are not thought to have talent. But they clearly do have talent of a different kind that simply cannot be accommodated into a dominant cultural idea of what talent ought to be. I mean, you may not think it talent to appear on, 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 on Jeremy Kyle to admit that you not only slept with your wife's best friend, but you interfered with the dog as well. Um, mm -hmm. But, but on the, other, the, the whole presentation of your case and the way in which you play it requires talent, I think. So I think what I'm saying in a roundabout way is, is that we need to look at how notions of talent are often part of the, a mechanism of cultural control Mm -hmm. uh, and also how we need possibly to see other forms of talent which aren't identified as talent as forms of personal liberation and indeed revolt against these dominant modes. That perhaps doesn't answer the question, but it's the sort of way I'm thinking about talent. No, it's a very um, interesting sort of subject just because of the various um, definitions of talent that you can have and I like the way that you described it as constructed for you know, a specific area, so a specific type of program or a specific... Um, media outlets. Well, it's clearly socially constructed. And the yeah. idea that someone should stand on a, uh, on a stage with a microphone and tell uh, a series of jokes that have the same narrative shape about uh, someone fictionally called his mother-in-law, you know, would seem to somebody from, let us say, um, I don't know, uh, Polynesia, an extraordinary idea. Uh, equally, no doubt, rowing a boat at an extraordinary velocity across the lagoon um, while standing on one leg while fishing would seem a bizarre idea of talent if we were all to turn up at the Hackney Empire. You know, so th the social construction of talent, I think, is, 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 is an important given, yeah. really. Thank you. Um, is, I, I, mean, I was just thinking, as, as you were speaking, um, isn't celebrity and the huge increase in the number of celebrities just closely, closely tied to technology and the fact that the media channels that we have now just growing and growing and growing and they need something to fill it and it seems like celebrity is the most obvious thing. Well, which comes first? Our appetite for celebrity or the broadcaster's need uh, or the broadcaster's decision to, to develop uh, reality TV, which is, of course, basically celebrity TV. Uh, I think you know, it's a more complex relationship between the two. It's clear that within the culture there is an appetite for celebrity. It's also clear that one of the fundamental changes that's taken place, and I talked a little bit about this a month ago in celebrity, is the dem democratisation, if I can put it like that, of celebrity by the media. You know, that people can turn up on television shows and become, as Jay Goody did, famous very quickly. But I don't think one can attribute somehow the blame to the media. There's a kind of interaction between the two that creates, uh, fulfills a need, creates a desire, fulfills a need, creates a desire, I think. Uh, uh, well, I, d I don't think it was blaming the media, but I mean... No, I'm sorry, blame's the wrong word, but, but no. you, you were suggesting that television fills a gap. Not just television. I was just thinking even within academic circles you have celebrity academics and there's a little frisson ah, when someone comes into ah, the room and yeah, yeah. it's almost endless, that's yeah. kind of what I mean. Well, that I think is something entirely different which I haven't talked about, which is the whole question of celebrification. Mm -hmm. The way in which the values that are sometimes constructed around these ideas of celebrity we've been talking about this afternoon and a month ago um, are, are, are now adapted across a whole range of other fields, most notably politics. Um, I mean, I think if you watch... I mean, there was a very good recent documentary on BBC One, I think, which explored the whole myth of JFK and argued quite forcefully this was the beginning of the, uh, the, of the celebrity politician uh, in which Kennedy has a photographer on hand the whole time, 
the images are controlled, stories are kept out but kept in. It's the whole process begins. So I think you're absolutely right, yeah. And indeed celebrity academics. Um, you know, I quoted David Starkey. Um, one might think also perhaps of Simon Sharma. Gifted scholars um, in their lives, but nonetheless they have a kind of kudos within popular cultural consumption uh, that, you know, someone who has spent 30 years of their life toiling in the British Library but never appeared on television doesn't mm. have. I think so. I think you're absolutely right. But it's another topic, I think, and, 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 and one that, 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 that poses enormous questions, really, uh, I think, in relation to uh, the number of people who have this status conferred upon or who aspire to it. Anybody else like to ask anything? Quite the best bit, this, I have to say. Yes. Um, I'm interested to know your thoughts on the current uh, debacle that seems to be unfolding with Charlie Sheen as he seems to be um, quite relevant really to this lecture um, because he seems to have skipped out the whole stage of PR um, and seems to be just doing his own PR really and whether you think that he's falling apart actually or whether this is just a spectacle that he's creating and, and is this what's going to become of all celebrities you will eventually PR will become irrelevant because celebrities know how to do it themselves how to create this persona, he's got a Twitter account with a million followers as of two days ago. Um, hard to know, isn't it? I, I, I mean, is this Icarus plunging um, <laughs> unseen into the ocean, or is this someone of such postmodern knowingness uh, using interpersonal communication uh, to sustain a new identity? Charlie Sheen, uh, uh, the friend on our mobile phone. I mean, I don't know, is the answer. Um, but something very interesting is happening. With regard to, 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 to public relations and to the management of all this, um, I see very little evidence to suggest that most people don't need professional help with that. I mean, the eternal presence of, of Max Clifford. Um, it's really interesting when I was doing the work for both these lectures to see just how many of the people I was interested in had at one time or other actually been advised by Max Clifford, uh, uh, either shortly or longly. I mean, it's extraordinary. I mean, and, and in a way, there's another entire kind of strain of thought that would look at uh, the role that, 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 that someone like him operating in an interesting corridor between, on the one hand, public relations, and on the other hand, personal management, in a quite new kind of way, uh, does this. Sorry, I've disappeared off. But uh, the Charlie Sheen thing, goodness. I mean, the, the, other, th the other story is, is, in a sense, in the, in the headlines, is, is Prince Andrew. I mean, much the same of, of many things we've been talking about today apply to this. What is rehab for Prince Andrew, I wonder? You know, a quick visit to the Gulf equivalent of uh, the Priory? You know? Um, who knows? Questions about the microphone's coming. Yes, I was just thinking about Joan of Arc, the maid of Orleans. I don't know if she had talent, but she had visions. She died very young too. But I did see the first Big Brother with Jane Goody in. Uh, with, um, I think it was Johnny Regan and Jane Goody who won it. And Jay came a third. And I hope nobody's offended, but I thought she was slightly backward at that particular time. Then she started mixed with showbiz people, and I think some of the brightness rubbed off, you know. But with D Diana, who was a, a children's nanny, a, a shy young girlfriend that turned into a princess and then an ambassador for the country, had two wonderful boy, children, baby boys. I think we all we, we saw her story in the papers virtually every day or every other day, and I think we emphasised with her life. And I'd like to see what you think about that. Um, I hope I wasn't making a judgment about either of these two women. I hope I was trying to describe what I think happened. Um, uh, uh, but I mean, I think what you said is absolutely right about both. I think there's one interesting thing about Jade Goody that, that it's rather hard to identify in any precise way, but it emerges in both versions of her autobiography. The role that clubbing played uh, in establishing a set of celebrity networks for her that, in, that allowed her uh, to, to, to sustain her celebrity. Um, uh, I think no one has done any work on, in particular, I can't remember the name of the one club she used to go to with Jack Tweed a lot, where she had kind of celebrity centres. She was always taken to the celebrity area. She had a close relationship with the guy who ran the club. The embassy, the embassy. Sorry, I've got the head. But no one, but I think, I think rather more than show business, it's, it's clubs and clubbing at a particular moment. 
that, that does that for her. But I hope I wasn't making a judgment about either. That's not what I intended to do. I'm interested in the phenomenon. How can one make a judgment? We don't actually know either of these people. Um, we have a set of images of them um, that we think we know. And that's, of course, the fundamental paradox and the comfort of celebrity. This is my friend, but I never know her or him. Anybody else? Uh, you mentioned about uh, the, the need for publicists, uh, for, for people, but I, I don't know if you'd agree, but it seems to me that one of the most remarkable things about Princess Diana was that she really was her own Max Clifford. She, she seemed to, to have an instinct for that, that she handled herself. I think that's true. Um, what I found interesting, Sarah Bradford's biography, which is, in a sense, the most recent, and as with all of Bradford's work, clearly gets closer to those kind of hidden locked doors uh, around royal palaces and anybody. Um, what it suggests very interestingly is that she used to consult people. She used to ask them to lunch and then do exactly the opposite. There's some wonderful accounts of Clive James, in his own words, being sent for to have lunch at Kensington Palace to be asked what, she, what he thought. And he then ruefully records in the interview with, 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 with Sarah Bradford that she did exactly the opposite. Um, I suspect she had an absolute instinct about how to manage it, but I do think Richard Kay, who's remained oddly quiet about his role in all of this, um, may have offered some quite good advice. Mm. And I also think that, that there were other links to some of the older women friends of hers uh, who, who, who uh, Bradford identifies who may have helped her. But I think you're right. I think in the end she perhaps reveals herself as a genius at public relations on her own behalf. Um, Really, I mean, knowing exactly. I mean, the, the, the Serpentine, I don't know if any of you ever looked at the footage of her arriving at the Serpentine on that day in that extraordinary, staggering black dress. And um, the car, if you walk the journey, which I half tried to do <laughs> a little while ago, came in the oddest possible way in order to give the photographers the maximum opportunity to see the car approaching the front of the Serpentine yeah. in order that they would be at the right place when she got out yes. of the car on the other side and then walked round. Yes. Now, she yes. must have known all that. Yeah. People aren't fools. I was a press photographer, and I photographed her many times. Right. And she was absolutely unerring. Well, then you will know. And one of the great things, I think, was at the Taj Mahal. Yeah. Oh. She appears alone. I, 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 She's in I the know. exact position. I know. I know. But, the, but yeah. I resisted showing that photograph because <laughs> what you always want to say, I don't know if you've seen this photograph, you may, she sits there alone at the Taj Mahal. Of course, there are hundreds of you taking the photograph. But the real irony, and the moment it's taken, is precisely to remind us that Prince Charles had once said to her, when they were courting, that he would take her to the Taj Mahal. And she's taken it herself, and he's not there. I mean, it's brilliant, it's brilliant, genius, absolutely genius, brilliant. Genius, yeah. I think we should stop, everybody. I think we've <laughs> probably had quite enough. Can I thank you all again very much for being such a wonderfully attentive. And thank you for terrific questions. Uh, as always, the questions are much more interesting than the lecture, but thank you very much indeed.